So today, we are going to talk about aeronautical networks, wireless networks. <coughs> and as the diagram shows, these, this is the wireless link which goes between the plane and the control tower. Right? And so, I mean, one thing we could talk about is how to provide wireless inside the plane, which is actually a trivial problem. It's not much of a problem. They just need to install a Wi-Fi thing inside and, you know, have a link. So we are not going to talk about that. We are talking about a more difficult problem, which is that the plane is moving at a very <coughs> high speed at uh, 600 miles per, hour, miles per hour or more and at a very long distance, and then you have to communicate at that high speed at that long distance. Right? So we will talk about um, what is the area of wireless application that we are talking about. Then we will talk about how it has moved over the last three, decade, three decades. And then the latest thing. So the latest thing that is happening is LDAX. And so we will talk about LDAX and what are the issues. And one of the issues is no spectrum, so the interference issues. And then, you know, some solutions for that interference. And um, while talking about um, wireless networks, I will be using the words, I, I just put this slide in the beginning as to what these different bands are. So you remember the electromagnetic spectrum we had shown from all the way from electric current to light. And wireless bands are named. And so for example, um, 3 to 30 megahertz is called high frequency. And this is the best band because high frequency, remember the higher the frequency, the shorter distance it goes because it is attenuated fast. 330 is really low frequency in, in, in today's term. Today we talk about gigahertz, not megahertz. So 330 goes very, very far. So that's what airplanes will need. I mean, that's what they need, is which goes several hundred miles. But that's not available. 3 to 30, how much can you have, right? So the next band is VHF, 30 to 300. And VHF is the next best frequency, and that's what they have been using for the last 20 years, but that is also gone. So now you want to expand, and the traffic is expanding, the needs are expanding, and so on and so forth. So they move on to the next band, which is called the L band. L band is from 950 to 1450. Actually, in round numbers, it is from 1 to 2 gigahertz, actually, but depending upon the countries, they allocate, you know, whatever frequency, they don't want, want to like it and so on and so forth. So this L band, the, the definition changes. So one definition would be from IEEE and another would be from FCC. F, FCC is the one that allocates the frequencies, right? So this is the band and it is named L, actually goes after L and B, which is a low noise block converter. So what happens is if you have a satellite disk in your home, the disk receives a very high frequency, but that frequency is very high, so what they do is they immediately convert into a, some medium frequency before it goes into your home. So that is called the low noise blocker block, LN, LNB. That LNB operates at this frequency, 950 to 1450 megahertz. So initially that was not really a frequency for transmission, but for internal use, and that was called L-band. Some people now have seen some places said as a long band, which could be true, um, but um, this is uh, one of the explanations for L. Then there is an S band which goes from, so L band would go technically from 1 to 2, 2 to 4 would be S band, 4 to 8 is C band, 8 to 12 is X band, and 12 to 18 is KU, and so on and so forth. Now, people who work in this aeronautical industry, and if you get a job in wireless there, I mean, they left and right, they use these words, KU band, KA band, you know, and so on and so forth. So it's, it has to be in your head as to what is KA band, what is KU band. So I put this slide here. And um, the three bands that we will really use are L band, then C band, and KU band. Now what is C band? C band is 4 to 8 gigahertz. So most of the A to 2.11A stuff, which is 5.8 gigahertz, is in C band. Right? So the C band is, um, would be the next one. Obviously that's kind of the frequency just too high uh, for uh, use here. But they do use KU band for satellites. 
So all the satellite transmission is at those frequencies, 18 to 26.5 gigahertz. Why at those frequencies? Because there is a lot of bandwidth available at those frequencies. And you could give 2 or 3 gigahertz, 4 gigahertz very easily. As opposed to here, we get few kilohertz. So, so the uh, satellites use KU band, KA band and so on and so forth. So there is some satellite communication as well for the planes. So that is we'll use K, KU band. But for our discussion in this, we are not going to talk about satellite today. So we will be basically limited to VHF and L band. Yeah. I actually don't know. Um, that part I did not investigate. So I am not sure what LNB does. And we are not going to use LNB, by the way. We just, I introduced LNB here just to introduce the letter L. Okay. So in our case, the signal is itself coming at 950 megahertz. So we are not going to really use LNB. But LNB is used in the satellite network. The satellite signal will be coming at 12 to 18. And that will be converted to 950 to 1450. And on the path, right actually next to the disk, there is an LNB block. And I remember this because at my home that probably went bad and, you know, the disk guy had to come and say, well, LNB was bad. You know, thing there. So that's a little box which goes right next to the disk. All right. So with that, um, let's just remember two frequencies very clearly. VHF, 30 to 300 megahertz, and L band, either 950 to 1450 or 1 to 2 gigahertz, whichever number you want to remember. So those are the two things that we will be using. Now, there are many things that the planes do. I mean, they have passenger telephones, which we will not talk about. We already said that. Then they have distance measuring equipment. So they have... Um, some equipment, some things on the ground, actually on the, on, the, on the runway, which transmit wireless signals. And then the plane, there is some equipment on the plane that can read those signals and figure out exactly how much aligned it is with the runway and all that. And, and it can use it for auto landing and things like that, right? So we are not going to talk about that. Actually, we'll, we have a slide on DME, but most of the, uh, that is actually and not part of the discussion that we have because they're not really intelligent networks like you know you don't, you don't really those are very primitive in some sense with today's um, standards then they have um, operation control and administrative control so operation control um, is um, um, more of a um, airline operation and airline administration. Then they have ADSB, Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, which basically says that this is um, trying to find out where, uh, who is on the on the sky. So basically, the the airports use many many different ways of finding out who is in the sky. One is that they send a radar signal and they sweep the whole sky to figure out how many planes are there and and um, which direction they are moving and so on so forth. So that is called independent broadcast because that is very similar to the radio, uh, to, to the police radar where you send some radar signal and reflections comes back regardless of what, what object it is, so that is independent. But there is another method which is dependent which means that you send a signal, radar signal, the receiving aircraft sends back another signal saying that, yep, I am here and here is my ID number. So that is more intelligent in some sense, but also it is dependent upon them replying. Right? So that is the de that is one. But again, we are not we are not going to talk about the but that is the radar thing. So we are going to talk, talk about that. Finally, there is a controller pilot data link communication. So that is where the controllers in the control tower talk to the pilot, and they have two things: they have voice communication, they have data communication. Why is they say, okay, ready to land or keep around, keep holding, 10-4, whatever. And the data communication is more between the machines, which actually measure the distance and tell them, you know, 
what to do. So we are going to really concentrate here, this part, uh, although the same network can probably be used for airline administrative control and operation control. Uh, and so, so this is the voice data communication. And there are many standards. And by the way, they don't have 1G, 2G, 3G, but I just kind of put this myself. So this is nothing to do with these generations and this is nothing with cell cellular things. Basically, these things are very primitive. These are the ones which I would call, and I've put in bold, I should have bolded the first one here because this is only black here. So in 80s, they had this system, and then in the 90s to 200s, and actually up till now, they have these three systems. And now they are working on this fourth, second system. I couldn't call it fourth generation because these are really primitive compared to what we have discussed so far. And primitive in the sense that the reason they are so primitive is because this is very difficult to change. Unlike changing Wi-Fi in your home, changing from 11B to 11N, this technology, once it works, people just don't want to touch it even if it, you know, is very low speed and so on and so forth, because there are so many lives involved and, you know, so much equipment involved, so many countries involved, so many, you know, so because every country has to probably deploy that technology, right? So this is moving very, very slow, and as you will see the rates later on that, <coughs> that, um, so anyway, so there have been lots of attempts at different proposals, so many of these are proposals that really did not make into deployment and so we will briefly explain those and then want to end up on this LDAX 1 and 2. So I put all of these into one category, which is the current category, past category, and then the future. Or maybe I should just label it that way, past, present, and future. Okay? So what is the first system? First system, which was called ACARS here, um, is was named for Aircraft Communication Addressing and Reporting System. And this was a very simple SMS system, basically short messages which could be sent between the plane and the control tower. Um, and it uses VHF. Um, but VHF is, um, does not go far enough when you are very far from the airport, which is the case in the polar region. In the polar region, there are not that many airports, so you can't really reach the nearest airport, so they need high frequency there. Um, and it was developed by a company called Air Inc. Um, in 1978. It has an analog radio. Now, Air Inc., by the way, is the only company that does all the air traffic control, uh, air traffic control networking. So there are two companies in the airline industry. One is called CETA, S-I-T-A, you might have heard that name. That does all the, all, the, all the passenger bookings and anything required with the computing in the airline industry is done by CETA, S-I-T-A. Anything new with the networking is done by this company. It's still today, worldwide. So these are big monopolies. Why? Eh? Why? Well, I mean, I, I think this industry doesn't change that much. I mean, that's what shows clearly. I mean, because it is highly regulated in FAA, this, that, and so many things. So maybe maybe other competitors, I don't know. I mean, that's a good question. I, I myself have, you know, if it is such a good business, why? <laughs> other people don't have it. But um, so that's, that's the, uh, that's the uh, company which, um, uh, which basically developed this standard. And all it did was sort um, text. And, um, and um, so that continued um, all the way up to 94. You can see 10 years, um, maybe more than 10 years, 16 years. And then basically they decided that we really need to use um, digital radio rather than analog radio. So, so this is where the second generation thought came in, in my mind. So basically, they developed four of them, VDL1, VDL2, VDL3, VDL4. One and three were just designed for, probably for experimentation. Two and four were deployed. So two and the four are really deployed. And um, VDL2 
um, basically is required in all aircraft flying in Europe. So that is very well deployed you know, for that reason. And it uses 8 PSK, and now you must know what is 8 PSK. That was the homework last time, although it was not due, but 8 PSK is the 8 phase shift keying. Um, that was used in Edge, if you remember. So that, that's what it uses. Over 25 kilohertz, it gives you 31 mega kilobits. So I mean, it doesn't really give you 3 bits per hertz, but gives you more like 1 bit per hertz because of the distances involved here. And it is widely implemented since 1994, VDL2, right? So that is the one of the, this, this is the link, AKRS and VDL2, right? Now we go to VDL3, which was again then developed but not used. VDL4 is um, <coughs> this added another element, which is aircraft to aircraft communication. So two aircrafts in the air can talk to each other. So there is mobile to mobile, which is without the ground in included, no master ground station is required. So this was developed in 2001 and uh, has some deployment. Then after that, they developed UAT, Universal Access Transceiver, which moved up in frequency. So basically, this is all VHS, that's what V is for, VHS digital link, right? So this one is now going uh, uh, basically a higher band, which is L band actually. So this is called UAT, Universal Access Transceiver, and it uses three megahertz. So this is actually a broadband link. However, it uses lots of bandwidth to get one megabits. And um, as a result of that, even that one megabit is divided among you know hundreds of aircrafts which are trying to land at an airport. And so each aircraft is allowed 16 byte or 32 byte message every second. So 32 byte per second, you can see how many not that many bits per second. Yeah. I'm sorry, your question is there is 981 to 984, or is it 981 plus minus 1.5? Is that the question? Huh? Yeah, so, so so you understand, every time we, pr we design a network, we have to design what, what frequency band it is in, and then how much frequency does it get, right? Is that the question? I mean, basically, so 981 is the band, and 3 megahertz is what it gets in that band. So, what's the frequency which they send? Oh, so basically, what will happen is 3 megahertz would could be 981 to 984, okay, or could be 981 plus minus 1.5, that's the detail that I haven't turned it down, but basically in that band, so it's like this, Wi-Fi uses 20 megahertz in 2.8 gigahertz band, we say, 2.4 gigahertz band, right? Now 2.4 gigahertz band goes all the way from 2.401 to 2. Point some, you know, maybe about 200 megahertz plus, something like that, and I, I can't have the number. Actually, it's, it's probably 60. So 2.4, 1 to 2.46 or something, okay? 60 megahertz band, right? Out of that, we get 20 megahertz anywhere. Right, and there are three channels, right, in Wi-Fi. Now here, similar detail would be there as to how much yeah, we have and how much we are giving, but you get basically three megahertz and I, since this band is very crowded, I can tell you there are not many channels. So there's only one channel of three megahertz at 981 megahertz. You have a question? No. Yeah, no. Any question? Uh, I was trying to figure out why uh, we keep such low frequencies. Is, does that have anything to do with weather? Because I remember you said when the frequency is, is too high that it gets affected uh, easily by weather. That's right. So there are several, okay, so I can go back, to, there is one slide, I actually removed it from this lecture because we had covered it in the previous lecture, which was effect of frequency. In the phi lecture, we had given it actually, and I will remind, I, I will probably remind you the key features of the frequency. So one very fundamental thing is that the longer frequencies have more attenuation. Higher frequencies are not longer. 
higher frequencies have more attenuation. If you go back to the file lecture, which you know, all of us have forgotten, the last formula had lambda somewhere, and the the smaller the lambda, more loss you have, right? In addition to the d, it, it had lambda. So the lambda is the wavelength, and so higher frequencies get attenuated very fast. If I take two frequency, which is um, uh, which is twice as much money as twice as other much, it probably will be attenuated by four times every kilometer. So you have to send a lot more power to s have the same distance. Alex, so that is one basic reason. And for that reason, for the given the same amount of power, the smaller frequencies will go far, far away for the same amount of power, <coughs> right? High frequency will go several hundred meters, several hundred kilometers. Very high frequency will go, you know, one tenth of that or one hundredth of that, right? And then you go to L band, it will go even one. See, the thing is, lambda is square, right? So it is just going to just by going factor of two or three, you are going to one ninth or something like that, right? Fourth. So that is one thing. Second thing is some frequencies. Now this is some some frequencies. This is nothing to do with the high frequency or low frequency. Some frequencies resonate with carbon mole molecule or hydrogen molecule or nitrogen molecule or some chemical thing, so that those frequencies are affected by that. Okay. So rain, for example, affects 28 gigahertz. All right. It doesn't affect 27 or 29, maybe, you know, so the thing is, but it affects 28, right, because there is some resonance there. So that is a bad frequency in that sense for rain and for, for use in some sense, right? So people will avoid that particular band. Does that answer your question? So yes, weather has effect, but weather has no, I mean, I cannot make a general formula for weather. Weather graph, you have to look at the graph, and the graph has peaks and Okay? All right. So now we are seeing, the one thing trend you are seeing is that we are moving up in the frequency band because the lower frequency band is just jammed, not enough available. So that is the key trend. And um, then there is this latest thing is 1090 ES, which is really stand for 1090 megahertz extended squitter. So basically this is, um, this is, Again, similar to the radar, this is actually a radar thing where um, they use this frequency 90, 1090 megahertz band and, uh, and then they use a special message which um, allows the plane to periodically broadcast their position, velocity and time continuously. So basically every few seconds or every few minutes the plane keeps saying, okay, well, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And so the people on the ground can monitor who is in the sky. So this is uh, similar to that ADSB thing. So this is for that um, dependent broadcast stuff. So anyway, so now we, we, what we have done is we have covered this line here, not full line, but up to VDL4, and then uh, these two. Now going further, so the in industry has been working on, so basically continuously over the last 20 years, FAA has sponsored studies for better networks. NASA has sponsored studies for better networks. And in Europe, two organizations. Um, again, the European um, airline control, just like FAA in the United States, there is European Euro control. And then um, European Commission, which is more like NSF, uh, which is sponsoring research on aeronautical networks. Okay, so those uh, have sponsored some things. And um, so we are going to now talk about some of those stuff as to what was researched uh, and may not have been deployed though. So one effect which was done in the United States and done by the huge network systems uh, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, um, which is called E-TDMA, and I couldn't find what E is for, but TDMA clearly is clear. Um, and um, so they followed, they, what they took was they took GSM. Now GSM is actually well proven technology, it is used worldwide. We know that this 80 percent of the cell phones use GSM. So they took GSM and then basically extended it with this um, thing 
where um, the slots are not totally assigned uh, centrally, but there, is, uh, there are two kinds of slots. They have some slots which are assigned to everyone. So these are small, um, smaller size slots where uh, if there are 200 aircrafts, each of the 200 aircrafts has a slot. All right, so you can always speak in that slot. Then there are other slots which are bigger, but you have to request them and then you get it, get, if you get the permission somehow, you know, uh, then you can use that, okay? And, and they have different quality of service, QS1, QS2, QS3, depending upon, you know, how much more you want, how much l uh, less um, uh, guarantees you want and so on and so forth. But these are guaranteed and then non-guaranteed, right? So that was one of the inventions they did. In ETDMA, the key invention was to have dedicated slot and the shared slot. And the reason I'm talking about this is because this is a difference from GSM, not only that, but also this thought actually has catch, caught on. So everything after that has that feature. All right? Where you give a very small reserved bandwidth and, and that reserved bandwidth allows you to also say, well, I want more, you know, and then, you know, you get more later on. You can actually send, you know, request for more. Second thing uh, is basically, and this is not new actually, this is just a matter of data, is that you, in, 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 even in GSM we had slots. If you remember the GSM, we had frames, and then inside the frames we had bursts, inside the bursts we had, you know, slots and all that. So they have slots here too. And um, what happens is that the gap between the slots, so when the one person stops speaking and the second can start speaking, there has to be a gap. So there is a gap. And then the second person starts speaking, everybody has to pick up, synchronize with them, then only they can receive the data, CRC, and then they die down. So, so these times have to be computed depending upon the distance you want to go. So GSM doesn't go that far. GSM goes only 5, 10 kilometers. Now you want it to go to 500, 10 hundred kilometers. So we need a lot of guard time. We need enough time so that my last bit can reach there and not collide with somebody else's last bit, first bit, right? So that guard time has been adjusted, and that guard time has been made bigger, and that what reduces the efficiency at these, you know, in, in these applications. I mean, the, the the problem with the aeronautical application is the distance, and and the yes, velocity. Right. So the distance affects the guard time. Yeah. What is the ramp up in Yeah. So basically, um, this is. Um, this is the time when nobody is speaking, right? And um, this is the time when we are clearly speaking and trying to synchronize. So this is the time when there is a particular bit pattern which has been designed as a synchronous bit pattern. You just look for that one zero, one zero, whatever pattern has been agreed upon, right? And um, so before that, I'm just thinking as to what you will, um, um, you will probably start speaking, although um, I don't know what this slope indicates. Um, why would you just increase the power slowly? So it, the way it is indicated here is that you increase the power slowly to the full power and then you synchronize. But so I... That graph means power? Huh? That graph means power? See, this one basically, that's what, what it should mean, is that this is a time on the x-axis and the y-axis is basically full power and then no power and this is the empty idle time. So uh, so the question is um, they ramp up the power and there must be some reason and, and it's not too much time actually this is this could as much be vertical almost. Uh, if you if I would have put the number here this was like 0 0.9 millisecond this was less than 0 0.1 millisecond here and so on and so forth. So it's, it's, it's very small time compared to the guard time. So, so it could as well be vertical, but I had to make a slope here because I want to put the word ramp up, six letters there. So this is not to the scale, but it's just um, so that you can read the text. All right. So. So they increase the power slowly and then, then they come up with the full power and synchronize data, CRC and decay. So the two features, two things we have to remember and this is the lesson basically and that's why we are discussing all this is that longer distance means 
bigger what? Bigger guard. Guard time. See, the thing is, because if two people are speaking, if they are very close, as soon as I sp stop, you can start. Right? If you are two miles away, then you have to wait until my last bit reaches you, and then you know, you say, okay, I'll, then you start speaking. So the distance, the time that we have to wait goes up. Yeah. Yeah, 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 controller tax. So, so this is, I'm just showing here in these slots, I'm just showing one, one side of the link. So I'm not showing what is coming down, I'm just showing what is going from the aircraft. Um, so yes, your question is perfect, that these slots are also coming from the aircraft, because the thing is, from the controller, actually it might be speaking continuously for a long time, even though it has slots, but it doesn't have to go up and down right from the controller but from the planes they have to come up and down because they just speak for a particular time right so this is only showing what we call the down link or the link from the aircraft to the ground tower similarly this is showing only the down link which is from the aircraft which is the more difficult part by the way that link the, where there are many transmitters and one receiver that is more difficult than one transmitter many receivers all right any other question all right so anyway ETDMA was never deployed but um, the reason I'm explaining that is because this is this is these two concepts which are used here then continued in the rest of the development after that LDL is another attempt which was just VDL shifted to L band so everything which was in VDL, which was like TDMA frame, GSM, and uh, some of this last kind of, so, so basically, this is very similar to GSM again. And you can see the GSM is kind of, you know, continuing in many of these technologies. And the main difference was that they allocated some slots for voice and some for data. So they made it both voice and data uh, in that sense for both, right? And so there is n nothing else new, so I'm not going to discuss any more. Well, but, shifted. yeah? So it's shifted to L band. How is it shifted? Okay, yeah, shifted means you have to redo the whole, whole calculation. Basically, when you change the frequency, there are many parameters that change. And actually, some of these parameters we will discuss in a minute. But um, uh, one of the parameters we said was changes the attenuation, right? Because if you go three times more frequency, the power you need nine times more, or you need to change something somewhere so that you can take care of that nine times more loss. Link budget changes, right? Um, second thing changes is, is, the, is the Doppler. Anybody remembers what is the Doppler? Doppler is the change in the frequency, right? Because of the motion. And if you go back to the Doppler formula, you will notice that there's a lambda in there too. And so, higher frequencies have more Doppler than lower frequencies. Lower frequencies are good in that sense, you know, you can use them at high velocity and not have any problem. Higher frequencies will change more. All right? So is LDL at a higher frequency? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the thing is, okay, okay. So I actually, I thought that was understood. L band, so we said we, VDL was VHS band, very high speed band, and we are moving it to L band. Now, anybody remembers what VHS band was? What number we said? It was 30 to 300 gig megahertz. 30 to 300 megahertz, right? And L band was three times bigger. I mean, 11, 950 to 1450, something like that, right? So we are going higher frequency. So that was shifted mean. Shifted means redesigned. But I'm not going to go through that detail of redesign because, I mean, I just want to consider a new concept. And so that we can then understand why what is happening today is happening. So the next thing which is actually deployed is called AMAX. And AMAX is the pretty new technology. AMAX completed October 2007, all-purpose multi-channel aviation communication systems. This is actually the reason we have to discuss ETDMA is because it uses 
that those two concepts that we talked about and the reason and then it uses xdl4 now xdl4 is vdl4 or ldl4 so vdl4 was the vhs digital link 4 and ldl4 would be l band digital link 4 so that shifted to l band right so that we we call it xdl4 right so those links had this property of um, allowing broadcast so that was taken from there and then they also took from gsm their codings whatever coding is used in gsm is used so this actually is not so much of a new invention it is more of a combination of these previous technologies and so that's why i had to discuss those previous technologies and now the only new thing here was that they didn't know how much spectrum every country will have so they allowed 100 kilohertz 200 kilohertz 400 kilohertz as much as you can get in that band and they have everything else is by like this similar like this whole diagram applies to a max this diagram applies to a max except that they limited it to just two qs not to, to QS 0, 1, 2, and 3, 4. So they just have QS 0 and QS 1, which they call it CAS 1, CAS 2. So this is actually showing their time diagram, and here actually I'm trying to show both the uplink and the downlink. So this is the uplink time. Now this is TDD, by the way. That's another thing. This is TDD, and therefore they have um, on the same frequency uplink, downlink, uplink, downlink, and there is some time reserved for insertion which is uh, actually coming from the aircraft when they want a new aircraft wants to come in they come in here now this one cost one is very similar to them it's basically the same thing as before where it's dedicated slot every airplane will which has been in the network will have one slot allocated here whether they are speaking or not they will have one slot this is um, the slot which is shared which you get it only after you get the permission to use it right so this is up one and up up one and up two up one is the, the regular uh, stuff up two is mostly the urgent stuff such as x cts that means uh, uh, guarantee to transmit uh, con uh, confirm to transmit um, and anyway and then this was the reservation so whatever the quick response you want from the tower from the ground station is put here most of the other big data that is the aimed at the aircraft goes here up one and up two and cast one and cast two cast one is very small cast two is very big similarly up one is very big up two is very small so so they divided into f five slots like five we can call them frames like this and um, so this is a max and this is deployed um let's see um this is um Actually, I didn't put it here on this slide, but I should have put it. I should probably put it. This is required in at least in the United States and other countries. So, so this is the latest thing in terms of um, technology, and you can see this is based upon GSM. And second thing it does is it has this slotting business where some slots are reserved and some are dedicated. So you don't have to worry about um, um, not being able to speak. And this covers up to 150 nm. Now let me in introduce that nm. Nm is not nanometer. Nm is nautical miles. A nautical mile is slightly bigger than a mile. It is defined by one degree angle on the Earth equator somehow, you know. If you take the Earth's equator and 360 degrees is the total, some relationship, and I forgot. So anyway, so it is slightly bigger than one mile. So anyway, so in the aeronautical literature, we see NM all the time, and I kind of you know used it here without really defining. So, so I just want to make sure that you understand, NM is nautical mile. All these speeds, etc., in, in these literature are always in nautical miles per hour. The distance is nautical miles. All the announcements are in nautical miles. So they use a different system than what we use, which is miles, right? All right. So let's see where we are in our this diagram that we are trying to cover. So we covered this LDL, and then we covered GSM. So we came to AMAX, and. Um, we covered ATM. So we have almost covered all of this bottom diagram. Now we are going to the top diagram. In the top diagram, we have to start from this end 
and then figure out these before we get to LDAX. So first thing is B VHF, broadband, very high frequency. Very high frequency band actually, as we said, goes from 30 to 300, but this is the particular part. 118 to 137 is what is used here by this. And it uses something called MCCDMA, multi-carrier CDMA. So I want to explain to you what is multi-carrier CDMA. Multi-carrier CDMA, and this is the kind of thing that you have to remember. You may not remember much of the other things, but you have to remember these fundamental things, such as the guard time increases the distance, or multi-carrier CDMA, what that is, right? So multi-carrier CDMA is combination of OFDM and CDMA. Okay, so what is OFDM? OFDM means we use multiple frequencies, right? Orthogonal frequencies. CDMA means we use multiple chips per bit. Remember the direct sequence method? Of course, these are multiple access. So we use multiple chips. We might use 10 chips, 15 chips, 20 chips. Basically, those are 20 bits per bit, right, per data bit. So in this multi-carrier CDMA, what you do is you take those 10 chips and put them on 10 frequencies, 10 subcarriers of the OFDM. If any one subcarrier dies, that particular chip is gone, but from the maybe the rest remaining nine chips, you can cal still calculate that one bit. Right? So that is what multi-carrier CDMA is. Is OFDM with CDMA where each chip is encoded in a separate frequency. As opposed to putting all 10 chips on one frequency, we put those 10 chips on 10 frequencies. Is that clear? So we, we take one bit, convert into 10 bits code, and then we put them on 10 frequencies. So each bit is encoded as multiple chips, and these chips are used to use, these chips use sub separate subcarrier of OFDM, and access to so we have said all of this, and this uses TDD, and, um, and whenever you have OFDM, you have to define how far the carriers are. In this case, the carriers are two kilohertz apart. And the reason I want to mention this number is because in OFDM, it is very important to find out how close the frequencies are. I mean, it's good to have lots of frequencies. And actually, that is very good because if you have lots of frequencies, then the symbols are big. And big symbols means, you know, the better things, I mean, in some sense, right? But the Doppler is a bad thing because Doppler, if two kilohertz might be too close, and Doppler, the one frequency might run into the second one. Right now, it turns out again the Doppler depends upon the lambda, upon the wavelength. So at this frequency band, 100 megahertz band, two kilohertz is not bad. But when we shift it, then we have to change this number here. So just like we shifted in the time domain, we shifted the guard band. In frequency domain, we have to shift the frequency spacing. Right. So that is what they did. So they have B A M C. BAMC is Broadband Aeronautical Multi-Carrier System in L-Band. So this is basically, they took the VVHF and moved it to L-Band. So they are now changing the frequency by factor. Now, let's see, what factor? They were working at 118 megahertz, and L-Band starts at 1,000 megahertz, right? 950 megahertz. So they are changing it by factor of 10. So they have to change all these parameters. So one parameter they have to change is the carrier spacing. Uh, okay, so first of all, second thing is they got rid of all CDMA. By this time, when they came here, CDMA was not a good thing, so they just went to straight OFDM, not CDM, multiple, multi-carrier CDMA. So that was another thing is that they use OFDM. And they are using FDD, which is not the right thing to do. So they are instead of, you remember FDD is two frequencies rather than TDMA, TDM, TDD where you just use one frequency, right? Now the reason TDD is good is because you can, you can adjust the uplink and downlink, right? With FDD, you are stuck with fixed uplink and downlink ratio. However, the reason they, these people have to do that is because they couldn't find big enough band together with FDD, they can have half of the band here, half of the band there. So that's what that's what the main reason for dividing the band. So they took two 500 kilohertz band, 
rather than one megahertz band which they could not find in L band. So they did FDD. And then they changed the spacing from 2 to 10. So they changed it by a factor of 5. So for the higher frequencies. And um, they use OFDMA instead of multi, multi MCC DMA. And they use 240 milliseconds per frame, which goes into four multi frames. And, 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 and so some of this is actually coming back from BBHS. And then, then they have ground station uses management frame. So there are basically framing actually is here, which I actually removed the slide because we, we won't be able to cover this in one hour, one and a half hour lecture. But basically what they have is a 240 millisecond super frame, uh, which divided into four parts plus one little part management frame. And in the down direction, management frame is used for random access. In the up direction, management is used for broadcast. So that is for common broadcast and common access. And then the multi frames are assigned as usual um, by the ground station. And then air to air mode, um, they wanted to design an air to air mode where aircraft could talk to each other, but, um, but um, and that would require a lot more synchronization that they were not able to succeed, so they could not design and they gave up on that one. Anyway, so this is the about three years old and um, in the same time there was another standard that was done called P34 which is from the EIA industry in America in the electronic industry association EIA project 34 and they have designed a standard for public safety now public safety is the fire engines police other people right but they also use air Right? Fire safety uses planes, helicopters. Right? So this standard that they designed P34 could go all the way up to 187 kilometer. Although it is not designed for aircraft, but the reason I am discussing here that one is uh, not for the aeronautical world, real aeronautical world, but I am discussing here because some of this feature were then taken over by the next standard. And it uses 50, 100, and 150 kilohertz channel in L band. So this was actually designed for L band. So then obviously, and it, it kind of covers the distance. So one question arises, why not just use this standard as it is? Um, and um, the good thing about this standard was the whole management and other things, which actually um, I did not discuss here, but that that is the part that was well done. So. The latest one, which is what we are discussing right now. So we are currently, for example, we are doing research ourselves on aeronautical networks and we are working on LDAX. So the LDAX <coughs> is going to use some of these that we are going to talk in a minute. So LDAX stands for L-Band Digital Aeronautical Communication System. Now there are two proposals. We call them type 1 and type 2. So basically LDAX 1 and LDAX 2. They are both designed for air ground, aircraft to ground communication. Airplane to airplane is left in the future. They both need to cover 200 nautical miles. So here, they agree, uh, here, the, here is the explanation of nautical miles. One nautical mile is one minute. Actually, that's why we are getting into trouble. 360 degrees is 360 times 60 minutes. So that is the, that is the circumference of the earth at the meridian, right, at the center. So basically one nautical mile is 1.15 um, mile or 1.8 kilometer. And it has to cover the motion of 600 knots per hour, which is also known as Mach 1. Mach 1 is the speed of sound. Sound travels at Mach 1, yeah, question? So. So um, this is the speed. And then the capacity, they have to be able to cover 200 aircrafts. Uh, and, um, and the road from, from each aircraft is only 4 kilobits per second, 4.8 kilobits per second. So that's what surprised me first. We have such a small rate, but there are 200 of them. And so total requirement, if you were to do the whole thing, P could be four, 1 megabits. And one megabit is very difficult to do at these um, distances. 
uh, and so you, and, and, and this particular band because you know you you don't have that many megahertz and so all safety related services of the of the plane have to be covered by this standard and that includes the departure clearance digital airport terminal information oceanic clearance and all that so everything that they need to do has to be done by these so so LDAX is future right so, so far what we had discussed was past something in the past was deployed something was researched now, LDAX is 100% research and 100% basically right now proposal as opposed to existing anything so the one group which is LDAX one group they took BAMC they took P34 and they took WiMAX they combined the best features of those three to make LDAX one from BAMC they took the protocol stack they took the media access control they took the data service link from P34 they took the preamble all right let me just explain some words here AGC is automatic gain control RL is the reverse link and pepper is um, peak amplitude peak uh, sorry the amplifier um, uh, sorry peak to average sorry peak to average power ratio pepper. now all of the acronyms have been described at the last slide and hopefully I didn't miss pepper let me just double check pepper I did miss pepper so <laughs> I tried to catch all of them in the last, but you know, some of them got, got through. All right, so pepper is peak to average power ratio. Now, so now that I have mentioned the word, let me explain what that is. That we are transmitting these waveforms. Each waveform has a peak and it has an average. When you design an amplifier, you have to design it for the peak. That is one thing. So if you if you have something which has a peak of one kilowatt, you have to design an amplifier for one kilowatt, so that you can am amplify that much. Second thing, you have to design a linearity from all the way from the peak to the average and below. So the amplifier has to be linear for a big range. If the peak to average ratio is small, then I can easily design a two kilowatt kilowatt amplifier which has linearity only in you know from 1.9 kilowatt to 2.1 kilowatt power, which is easy. On the other hand, if I asked you that, no, design an amplifier which is linear from 1.1 kilowatt to 2.9 kilowatt, that's a lot of range to cover and that amplifier is very expensive. And on the top of this, amplifier is the most expensive part of the whole wireless system. All right? So, music too. Huh? Music too. what? An amplifier is music. music? Like, when you have to build one of those speakers. Uh -huh. The amplifier is the key part. The amplifier is expensive. Expensive, right. So amplifiers are expensive. And you won't believe it, when you go to these standards bodies, they go to a great extent fighting for the pepper reduction. So there is this uh, LTE versus, I haven't discussed LTE, but one of these days I will discuss LTE. LTE is the new standard in the cellular world and WiMAX is the old standard. The main difference is the pepper. Okay? And now both sides will argue as to whether that is significant or not, but that term here appeared here, so I, I thought I would just mention it. So basically we want to reduce pepper as much as possible. What is it? Peak to average power ratio. We want to make peak and average as close as possible. And one of the negative points of OFDM is, in general, this is any OFDM is that every carrier has a different peak and different average. So the peak to average ratio is very high compared to single carrier systems. In the single carrier system, there's only one carrier and you can come, you know, you can keep the peak to average somewhat close to each other. But OFDM has a high pepper. All right, so so they borrowed all that. Now AGC is automatic gain control, which is kind of understood. RL is the reverse link. 
<laughs> and then they took all the Mac layer slots and control message formats and, and addressing, etc., from P34. From the Ymax, they borrowed the tile concepts. If you remember the tiles and the chunks and things like that, they borrowed that from the Ymax. They have the forward and the reverse link allocation map. In Ymax, we used to have map and down link and up link map. They took it from there. And the request scheduling and grant, etc., they took it from Ymax. So they took all of these ideas put together into a proposal called LDAX-1. All right, any question about LDAX-1? I actually originally had many more slides on LDAX-1, but then because of the time restriction, I removed them. And I suppose this much is sufficient for our discussion. So if there are no questions, I move to LDAX-2. So the second group took that GSM stuff as before and followed the same lines, GSM, UAT, and AMAX and put together called LDAX2. So it is basically it takes the GSM file, AMAX, MAC, and UAT frame structure. So it took best feature of those three in some sense. And, um, and so they use this coding GMSK, Gaussian shift king, Gaussian um, Gaussian, again, I, I forget these things, so let me see if we got it here. GMSK, I missed that one too. So, two of them missed. Um, SK shift key. Hmm? SK shift key. SK shift key, yeah. M is what I'm kind of not remembering right now, but. Um, but. Um, hmm? Anyway, it's actually in, in the GSM slide. If you have the GSM lecture, it is, it, is, it is in that one, and I remember that one I put in the acronym list there. Anyway, so GSM works at um, these three frequencies, and so this is kind of easy to translate because we are L band is very close to 900 megahertz, so we can just take the thing from 900 megahertz. It's a tested concept. There are lots of equipment available, and um, and. Uh, so they don't use, but still, this version does not use any of the 2.5 stuff that we talked about as GPRS, et cetera, et cetera. It uses the basic GSM, the original 2G. So actually, in that reference, I will have to change this diagram that I have here, 1G, 2G, 3G, because um, this is really not correct. This um, LDAX2 is still 2G. And um, so rather than calling them 1G, 2G, I should just call them past, present, and future. And that would be more accurate because um, um, in terms of generation, they do not pass the test. All right. So anyway, so the summary of this is what we need to remember is that we are moving up in this to L band. And there are two proposals for L band. One is based upon OFDM, and one is based upon you know, the TDMA, GSM concept. Now remember, GSM is 30-year-old technology. OFDM is just five-year-old technology, right? And so, um, five, ten-year-old. So that is the, that is, I mean, that shows my biases um, as to where I, what I prefer. But anyway, one thing now, the next rest of the lecture is talking about the spectrum is the problems with the interference. So the one issue with is that that there is no real spectrum available. The L band is fully occupied. L band has many, many different applications. So applications are listed here. DME, distance measuring equipment. JTIDS is the joint tactical information distribution system, which is the military. MIDS and SSR is radar, and GSM is right there below L band. So all of these things are there, and DME is all over. DME is here, DME is here, DME is here. Now the thing is, these bands have been allocated but may not be used in the sense that DME is all there, but in maybe in St. Louis they're not using that part of the DME, so we can use LDAX there, right? That's the idea. Is that even though it is allocated, but they may not be used, and so we can use it for aeronautical purposes there. And so some proposals are that we can use LDAX one um, forward link here and the reverse link there, or forward link here and the reverse link there. So wherever we can find 500 kilohertz we can use forward and the reverse links and things like that. So this is fine. 
All right, so we will find a piece of a spectrum which is not being used or you know, being used far away. So the question is whether this will cause any interference or problem to either to the current users or to LDAX. Uh, now before, um, so, all right, before we go into discussion of the um, interference, I just put some parameters here which really are not significant because we have already talked about all of that. But let me just um, motivate some of them. So we have 500 kilohertz in LDAX1, 500 kilohertz for uplink and 5 for downlink. And we decided that we will want to keep the subcarriers at 10 kilohertz, and therefore we get about 50 subcarriers. So the number for FFT is 64. This is similar to an exercise that you had done before, where we gave you the band and we gave you the spacing, and then we asked you to calculate how much, how many carriers you will have and how much FFT you will need. 64 FFT. That gives you basically how much would be the symbol and all that. And so, I mean, these numbers really are not now relevant at the, for this class. Um, but when we are doing the interference analysis, we'll have to see whether this spacing is good enough for the speed that we're talking about, Doppler. So basically, um, the subcarrier spacing is one of the things that we, 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 have, we are working on and checking out whether that is for the speed, the Doppler will not cause a problem. And whether we need to even further increase this 10 to 20, you know, or some other number. In terms of modulation, LDAX1 uses OFDM, LDAX2 uses single carrier, um, so here GMSK, Gaussian minimum shift clean. Um, and so, so the, this actually is very innocent slide because there's nothing here we can, um, I mean, this is very well proven. GMSK is proven, OFDM is proven. And so these things have been proven. The key advantage of OFDM are that um, it allows, if you, even if you're farther than the coverage area, the, the thing doesn't fall off totally. It just, it's very graceful degradation. It, frequency selective errors are really done very well. The modulation can be changed uh, for each frequency. The main problem is that you need this, um, actually the, the problem is not listed here, but the main problem is you need synchronization, the time synchronization. And so this is um, basically uh, trying to see which one would be the better one, LDAX1 or LDAX2. And I'm all for LDAX1 because it is OFDM. The data rate, um, LDAX1 actually uses uh, 500 megahertz in one direction, 500 other megahertz in the other direction. Using those two, it gets about 300 kilobits to 220 kilobits, 300 kilobits to 1300 kilobits in the forward link, and 220 to 1030 in the reverse link. So this is 500 megahertz, 500 megahertz. So the total you get about 0 0.5 to 2 bits per hertz, which is kind of the limit right now. I mean, that is the limit. Six bits per hertz is the limit for these shorter distance networks, like WiMAX. But this is much longer distance. So three bits is kind of the limit. LDAX2 gives you 270 kilobits using 200 kilohertz. And so that is about 1.6. That is kind of below the limit. That is kind of very, very, I mean, we can make an improvement there. Because this is 30-year-old technology. They are still using that same. 30 year old GMSK, so that's why they're so low. But the next uh, two or three slides, we want to talk about interference. And these are all the things that are in that spectrum that you saw before. We had DME, we had UAT, we had extended squitter, we had SSR, JTAGs, and the next to the spectrum is uh, GSM and GNSS. All of these things are going to interfere with our LDAX. DME, I've already explained to you. Uh, DME is the distance measuring equipment and every aircraft is, it has antennas for DME and they listen and transmit pulses to these equipment which, is, which are embedded on the road um, and the, at the, air, at the air, uh, airport. So they transmit 700 watts. So this plane, for example, is transmitting 700 watts, which is 58 dBm. And uh, the thing on the ground is transmitting one kilowatt uh, 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 power. So this is a lot of power being transmitted and now we have our next antenna which is our LDAX antenna. So how much power will that need? 
So if you calculate that um, the DM is transmitting 58 and the, the distance between these two antenna is not very much, so the loss is 35 dBm. So 23 dBm of that will be hurt by this other antenna. So that's a significant interference. So then we have started working on the issue of the interference is so significant because we cannot remove that other antenna and these antennas have to survive. So they then started looking into ways of um, how to re reduce this and we found the answer in Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Now these are, uh, this is part of our research by the way, what I'm talking here in the next few slides. So Bluetooth and Wi-Fi use the same bandwidth, same band, 2.4 gigahertz band. And, um, and they don't, and so every device right now has two antennas. For example, my computer has two antenna. One is the Wi-Fi antenna and one has Bluetooth antenna. It's right, both built in. How do they avoid each other? Well, IEEE has done quite a bit of a study and they have come up with two strategies. One is called collaborative strategies where if there is one computer which is, has both the antennas, it could just not do the transmission at the same time. It could just say, well, look, I want to do Wi-Fi transmission, so I'm going to delay Bluetooth for a second. Or if I want to do Bluetooth, I'm going to delay Wi-Fi for a second. Or it really could be a millisecond. So that is called collaborative coexistence strategy, where both networks are on the same equipment, laptop or iPhone. So you do time division. Bluetooth skips the slots when the Wi-Fi is busy, and the Wi-Fi reserves the time for Bluetooth between the beacons or they could do packet traffic arbitration. The packets are prioritized and queued on a common queue, so only one thing is going, either Bluetooth is going or Wi-Fi is going. Or you have a notch filter where some frequency is reserved for Bluetooth and that is not used by the OFDM. So those are the things that Wi-Fi is doing. We could do similar things in, in the aeronautical industry. Non-collaborative strategy is when the two networks are not in the same control. So in that case, you really, what you have to do is you have to measure the other side and somehow take action so that the, that doesn't happen. So basically what you do is you measure the noise level and the error rate. If the error rate is random, if the bit errors are random, that means this is not the signal, this is a noise. See, there, I mean, there is a real noise and there is this noise from the other antenna. So you, if it is the noise from the other antenna, then, um, so Bluetooth uses coding, FEC, modulation, depending upon the interference. So basically there are coding techniques. Some coding techniques are designed for what we call block errors and some are designed for random errors. Random errors are good for noise, block errors are good for interference, right? So you change the coding to be either block or random. For example, FEC is not good if it is a block error. FEC is good only if it is random error. So we don't use FEC. Master delay policy, Bluetooth keeps track of error rates on various frequencies, and so Bluetooth is frequency hopping, right? So it uses 53 frequencies, uh, or 79 frequencies, and so it keeps track of on every frequency how much was the error rate, and it really doesn't go to the frequency that the interference is high. If suppose there is a Wi-Fi which is using 20 megahertz, it will not use those 20 frequencies, right? Or it uses adaptive hop frequency, where hop only were good frequency, which is similar to this master delay policy, and adaptive notch filter on Wi-Fi. And the Wi-Fi, if it is using 11A, it is using OFDM, it could instantly figure out where Bluetooth is and not use that. Okay. So that is the kind of thing. So basically that brings us to the end of our lecture. So the summary is that the latest thing in the aeronautical networks is LDAX1 and LDAX2. LDAX1 is OFDM based, LDAX2 is single carrier, um, LDAX1 uses FDD, LDAX2 uses TDD, it uses the LDAX2 has to use only particular lower band of the L band because they are, they are using this the GSM technology so that they have to keep close to GSM band unless they want to change the whole thing and they use, they get very little is efficiency, single carrier. So if you were to compare these two, I think OFTM is better, efficiency is better here, the flexibility is more, but the TDD is better here. And then the next uh, results I have to do with the, with the interference. So these things, um, SSR and all that, they use the same band and they have to be on the same plane 
and that would cause interference. And so therefore, we need to work and develop these coexistence strategies. Um, and um, I actually did not talk about the GSM interference, but the GSM towers are next to the ground tower. So the GSM tower can interfere with the ground tower. And that interference is very significant too. And, and, the, and the problem is that the GSM towers might be many of them. So there is a Verizon tower, there is, I mean, Verizon is actually not GSM, but there could be T-Mobile tower, there could be AT&T tower, and things like that, right? So, so that's, that, that has to be worked out. And so that is a concern. And then um, LDAX has better chance of coexistence because of the OFDM. And um, whereas um, there is single carrier and therefore it, coexistence would be a difficulty. So need to extend known coexistence strategies to LDAC. So this is what we are working on right now. OK? All right, so that is the summary. And then uh, these are the articles in Wikipedia. Obviously, Wikipedia has everything about past, but has nothing about the future. They don't really catalog the research that well. So LDAC is not in Wikipedia. Um, the LDAC is described in these documents, um, which um, are actually at this website, Eurocontrol. I don't know whether I want you to read uh, any of those documents. Um, I just um, have put there as a reference. And um, there is um, basically, if you ever need to go there, you can go there. But um, um, if I really want you to just concentrate on what we covered in the class. And so this is the end of uh, any question, final question. How many people are taking the exam on Monday? Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah, you have a choice. No, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. So the, there are two exams, two midterms. This is the second midterm. And we will take the best of the two midterms. So so some people, I mean, um, I mean, I would not ask you to, I, I do not want you to take that choice. If you have a choice, they say, well, I am doing so well in the first exam. I don't want to do the second exam, OK? Uh, if you are in the lower half of the second exam, first exam, you really need to take the first exam if you are you know, not in the upper half, things like that, right? But the reason I don't want to take the choice is because then you will miss one third of the class. You want to review the chapters, you want to have the knowledge, and you really will not get the complete course that you really need to. So I would really encourage everybody to take the exam, please, okay? Even if you do bad, it doesn't affect you. Yeah, next question. No, there's third one. Yeah, third one. There's third one. Um, and so, so my, my Monday exam. So the reason I asked how many, so how many people are not taking Monday exam? I know you're not sure right now, but hopefully. Huh? Huh? Yeah, right. The people who are missing today. I, I know. I mean, Liz, what is her name? Liven Zhang did not take the first exam. She has to take this exam, otherwise she will fail the whole course. So I mean, that is, that is given, that people who did not take the first one, they have to take the second one. The reason I'm asking is that next Wednesday, I have to be out of the city. So the next Wednesday lecture would be, would be by remote. I, and I give remote lectures. You have taken remote classes. Most, any of you have taken 473 have seen the remote classes, or any classes, right? Remote. But I could switch the exam in the class. In that case, the exam would be remote, and the class would be local. Now, if I took the exam on Wednesday instead of Monday, and we will cover only up to whatever you are covering today, Wednesday, would anybody have a difficulty taking the exam on Wednesday? Yeah. At least six people. Right? Better for, me. Better for you? Yes. <laughs> OK. It gives you two more days. So the thing is, I'm not confirming this. I have to confirm the other four, and in particular, because you know I know that they have to take the exam. And if any one of them have difficulty, I don't want to change anything. I will go ahead, have the exam on Monday. So we will wait for an email. And um, so basically, if, if everybody agrees, then I will move the exam, and I will give the lecture on Monday and the exam on Wednesday. And I will tell you, you know, pretty soon, as soon as I am able to contact these four people. <laughs>